Topic Notes 1.4, pH and the carbonate cycle. This is an image of pillar coral found down in the Keys. Now, coral has a skeletal system made out of calcium carbonate. And calcium carbonate is sensitive to pH. If it's a little too acidic, that'll actually start to dissolve and weaken calcium carbonate structures. The ocean is actually a little bit basic. And that is sort of the discussion we're going to have today. We're going to talk about pH, understand how it works, and apply it to, of course, the natural environment. So let's get started. Time for our main ideas. The ocean has a pH of about 8 and is maintained by the process of buffering. Increased atmospheric CO2 is resulting in decreased pH within the ocean, otherwise known as ocean acidification, causing negative impacts to marine life. Chemical compounds are classified as either acids or bases depending on how they ionize in water. Acids release hydrogen ions, H+, when added to water, whereas a base, otherwise known as alkaline substances, can bind hydrogen and remove them from the solution. You may have even done one of those labs in Maple Biddle School where you have the pH paper as shown over on the left, and you put a little dab of the substance in there and see what color it matches to find out the pH. And you might find that lemons, for example, are very acidic. You might find that baking soda is very basic, that kind of a thing. So what is pH? We are talking about the potential of hydrogen. The name is actually a little sketchy in terms of where it came up, but we tend to think of it as the potential of hydrogen or power of hydrogen. And it's an indicator of that concentration of hydrogen ions, H plus, in the volume of solution. Now, I have to put a pro quo on this, a little advisory warning. When we are talking about H plus hydrogen ions, we're really talking about hydronium or H3 O plus ions, but there's a long-standing tradition of simplifying it to hydrogen ions, H plus. I just want you to know that in case you move on to other courses at a higher level. However, for our purposes here in this course, H plus is just fine. So defining this finally, pH is a numeric value expressing the acidity or alkalinity of a solution on a logarithmic scale. In fact, it's a negative logarithmic scale. Scale. So pH actually equals the negative log of the concentration of hydrogen ions. Essentially what this means is that a change of one pH unit indicates a tenfold change in concentration. So there's a very big difference between, for example, a pH of 8 or 9 or 5 and 4. Now the pH scale ranges from 0 to 14, 0 being the most acidic uh, having a pH below 7 with a high concentration of hydrogen ions, alkaline being above 7, larger numbers, lower concentration of hydrogen ions, and neutral being 7 exactly. Now, if you look at the scale, it gives you a certain amount of uh, common items and where they fall on the scale. Like bleach is uh, 13, which is very alkaline or basic. Uh, you've got milk of magnesia, baking soda is 9, and seawater is 8, which is slightly basic comparatively. And then 0 being distilled water, uh, where it's essentially neutral. And then you get to like urine is pH of 6, black coffee is 5, tomato juice 4, orange juice, lemon juice, and gastric acid 1. So hydrogen ions spontaneously are created in pure water, essentially H2O splits off into hydrogen ion and an hydroxide ion. And this is the equation right below that kind of shows you that balance. Now, pure water has a pH of 7, like we said before, equal concentrations of hydrogen ions and hydroxide ions. Now, ocean water is slightly alkaline or basic with an average pH of around 8.1. It contains alkaline ions, including bicarbonate and carbonate. Now, alkaline ions bind hydrogen ions and thus remove them from the solution and reduce the acidity and essentially increase the pH. 
Now, in order to understand pH in the ocean, we need to understand what a buffer is because pH in the ocean is relatively stable due to this thing called buffering. A buffer is a substance that reduces the tendency of a solution to become too acidic or too alkaline, depending on what we're talking about. Now let's run a little experiment. Let's say we have two beakers and they are on the top right in the diagram. The beaker to the top left is unbuffered water, just plain old H2O. The beaker on the top right is H2O with a buffer for 7.0 added into the water. Now we have a pH meter in each beaker and they're both reading seven at the point of the start of the experiment. Now we're gonna add one milliliter of 0.1 molar hydrochloric acid to both the unbuffered water and the buffered water. And as you see the, P, the pH meter there, it's at 3.0 for the unbuffered water. It really dropped it down quite a bit. Whereas the buffered water stabilized at 6.9. So it dropped just a bit, but it relatively maintains stability. That's the power of a buffer. So the result of this is the ocean essentially maintains that pH of around 8, 8.1, because essentially CO2 combines with water in several reactions that either frees up or releases hydrogen ions. And you can see from this graphic surface ocean pH, this is November 2010, but it gives you an idea, a snapshot. And you can see where all along from pole to pole, from coast to coast, the highest pH is around 8.1, the lowest is about 8.05. So they, it all stays relatively stable. So let's walk through this process. So first, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere diffuses into the water. It combines with water to form carbonic acid, which is a weak acid found in carbonated drinks. Now, some of the carbonic acid molecules disassociate into bicarbonate and thus also releasing a hydrogen ion. Now, this, of course, can make the water more acidic. Now, bicarbonate ions can disassociate further into a carbonate ion, releasing another hydrogen ion, again, making the water even more acidic. Now, there is a dynamic equilibrium between carbon dioxide, bicarbonate, and carbonic acid. Things go both ways. So when the water becomes too acidic, then the equation, as you see it in front of you, is going to go essentially to the left. Uh, and, it, and you're going to have hydrogen ions combine with carbonate to create bicarbonate another hydrogen ion binding with bicarbonate to make carbonic acid. It's going to go that direction. Now, if the water becomes too alkaline, then it's going to shift and go towards the right. And it's going to release hydrogen ions to bring that pH back down a bit. Now, another thing to note, carbon can actually be trapped. If you combine carbonate with calcium, you get calcium carbonate, which of course builds the skeletal systems of corals and the exoskeletons of crabs and things like that as well. And that can get trapped up into biological systems. It can also get deposited on the sea floor uh, for long periods of time, essentially sequestered. This is how essentially the ocean can become a carbon sink, which we're going to get into in another lecture a little bit farther down the line. Now, another thing to note is calcium carbonate essentially is a great source of carbonate for buffering. Uh, this is one of the reasons why in marine aquariums, for example, we have substrates, the stuff on the bottom, uh, essentially is crushed aragonite and crushed coral, things like that. So it's all calcium carbonate based. And so as the pH changes, it can dissolve and release carbonate, which can help buffer the system. Now let's look at how pH changes with depth. Now pH varies with depth as the amount of carbon dioxide changes. So in the shallow water, there's less carbon dioxide with an increased pH. It's closer to 8.5. This is because there's a high density of photosynthetic organisms which use up carbon dioxide, even though you have access to it diffusing from the atmosphere. Now in the middle depths, you're going to notice that there is more carbon dioxide and thus it is slightly lower in pH, around 7.5 if you look at the graph the more carbon dioxide is present because you have a lot more respiration going on and less photosynthesis. So that sort of balances things a little differently. Now below 3000 meters, the water is actually again more alkaline. It's above 7.5. 
This is because there's less organic activity going on, which results in a decrease in respiration and carbon dioxide in general. Now this gets us into our last little topic, which is ocean acidification. Now since the Industrial Revolution in the 1800s, human activity has caused atmospheric carbon dioxide concentrations to increase dramatically. You can look at the graph here from NOAA on the right, which goes all the way through 2020. Uh, and the CO2 concentrations are now exceeding 400 parts per million, which is 40% higher than in any time prior to 1750. Now you might notice that there's an up and down in the red line every year. And this is actually due to the fact that the earth sort of breathes, if you will. Essentially, different portions of our planet are in a high productive mode in terms of photosynthesis during different times of year, spring, summer, things like that. And so essentially every year annually, the earth has essentially a peak um, CO2 account and a, and a low CO2 amount in the atmosphere. And that's what's being uh, looked at in that kind of variation annually. However, the trend line is really what we want to pay attention to. The gradual increase overall as we move forward in time. So why do we even care about this? Well, here's the deal. Increased carbon dioxide in the oceans essentially causes the pH to decrease. It becomes more acidic. And this can cause calcium carbonate minerals to dissolve. Now, this is really important for marine life because a lot of marine life has calcium carbonate components, including corals, crabs, oysters, and even a lot of the plankton that are, that's out there. So they're all at risk. It can disrupt the food chain massively, and it can cause a lot of economic problems and food production will decrease. Here on the uh, bottom, you see an image of a snail shell Within 45 days, you can see how it starts to dissolve just through this slight acidic environment. We're going to be touching base on this whole ocean acidification thing a little bit later on as well in the coral reef section. But it's great to see it right now while we're talking about pH, just so you have that connection. And that wraps it up for today. Remember our main ideas. The ocean has a pH of about 8 and is maintained by the process of buffering. Increased atmospheric carbon dioxide is resulting in decreased pH within the ocean, and ocean acidification occurs. This causes negative impacts to marine life. And of course, until next time, keep learning!